Amen. Dear Lord, thank you that you are our risen Lord, that you know no equal. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to you. So today, Lord, we gather in your name, celebrating the fact that you're risen from the dead, realizing, Lord, that we share with you both in your sufferings as well as in your resurrection. And we pray, Lord, that you would be here with us today. Speak to us by your spirit. Lord, let dead places in our lives be brought to life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So today we remember and celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ that could I say, I don't think it's an overstatement, to say it literally changes everything. Not only in history, but in our lives. Isn't that true? Amen. All four Gospels, rightly, give us an account of the resurrection. Actually, let me go back to that. Or back to that. Uh, there are no recorded eyewitnesses of Jesus rising from the dead. No, none of his followers, not even the Roman guards that were there. What they did when they, they ran for their, well, not for their life, but thankfully they still had their lives, and they ran back to the chief priests and the Pharisees, they shared what they witnessed. What they had witnessed was a severe earthquake and an angel appearing and them being knocked flat on their faces. Well, it doesn't say that, but they, were, they were, became like dead men, so however dead men act, they didn't see Jesus rise from the dead. Isn't that interesting? What they saw was an angel and they saw an empty tomb. That's what they saw. And so all four Gospels give us an account of the empty tomb by assumption than the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let's just kind of uh, set the stage again. We ran through this last week, but do it again in just briefer detail. Um, a week earlier, so Jesus rose on the first day of the week, which is Sunday. A week earlier on a Sunday, he had made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And it um, uh, looked a little bit like an NFL World uh, Super Bowl champion victory parade in their hometown. I mean, there was a lot of cheering going on and people were excited. That's what it looked like on the Sunday before triumphal, this triumphal entry. But you know, by Thursday night, the Last Supper, and then Friday early morning, probably even before dawn, he was arrested and taken uh, into custody, given a mock trial, and by about 9 o'clock that morning, Friday morning, was nailed to a Roman cross. The day wore on. Let's not forget that there were two other men crucified with him. Isn't that interesting? Probably they had been on what's called, we would call death row. But since they were going to have a crucifixion anyway, let's just bring them along. So Jesus' crucifixion became the occasion of their final day. But there you have, interestingly enough, two criminals. Can we say that in a way they represent the human race? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So you had two criminals, but one of them made a, an eternity-changing decision as he hung with nails in his hands, as he hung on a crude Roman cross, not a nice polished piece of ornamental furniture like that, on a crude, rough-hewn Roman cross. And he, he said to this one who was being crucified between the two of them, Remember me today, remember me when you come into your kingdom. How, had he followed Jesus? How did he know to even use those words? Come into your kingdom. What, what, what did he mean by that? And yet he was speaking the reality. You are a king. Your kingdom has come, but not yet. But when it's here in fullness, remember me. <laughs> 
And Jesus said to him, today, today, not tomorrow, not at the second coming, today, you will be with me in paradise. And he said that to one, but not to the other. Again, both of these men typifying the human race. Some respond to Jesus and die physically. And some do not respond to Jesus and die physically. But only the ones who accept Jesus go to be in paradise. Wow, right there. That is the gospel just played out before us. About three o'clock, and each gospel has a it's sort of a different addition to the narrative. One says that he cried out with a loud voice. And I love that because it's like the author of life being squelched by death, just Rah! But he also said, it is finished. His life work, ministry was finished. But the plan of God, the whole Old Testament sacrificial system, bring the animal once a year for, on the Day of Atonement and slaughter the animal as a sacrifice to pay for the sins of the people. It's all finished, done, complete. The Bible says that when that happened, the veil in the temple that separated the holy place from the most holy was rent, torn in two. There was no longer a separation for those who would enter into God's presence from coming directly to God. And I, and I, I love how Pastor Jack kind of grabbed a hold of that, Jack Hayford, for his church down in Van Nuys, California. And he called it the Church on the Way. Well, they were on a boulevard called the Van Nuys, I think it was called Van Nuys Way. But it comes out of, I think it's uh, Hebrews 9 or 10, Jesus on his death, when that veil was torn, he opened up a new and living way for us to come into God's presence. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And then the uh, Jews who had clamored for Jesus' death began to get a little bit nervous because they had a religion, you know, and their religion needed to be followed. And, and their religion was we can't have any bodies hanging on a cross come sundown because sundown of Friday becomes Sabbath of Saturday, the beginning of Shabbat. Shabbat. And it's an abomination to have a, a, a body hanging on a corpse on the Sabbath. So let's, let's get this over with quickly. Pilate, can you, can you break their legs? And it was by virtue of their legs that the men on a cross could lift themselves up so that they could breathe. Every breath required them to do that. Because they were hanging in such a way that their lungs were compressed just hanging. So when your legs are broken, you can't push yourself up. And guess what? You're going to die pretty quick. But when the soldiers came to break Jesus' legs, as you know, he was already dead. But interestingly, one of the soldiers, why would he do this? I guess just to prove the point, make sure we got the deed done, takes his spear and pierces the side of Jesus, and out comes blood and water, but thus fulfilling a scripture from the Old Testament. And then a member of the Sanhedrin, that's the Jewish ruling council, who had voted to put Jesus to death, but this guy didn't consent to that. His name is Joseph of Arimathea. And he goes to Pilate, and he says, may I have your permission, sir, to take Jesus' corpse off the cross? Pilate says, really? You think he's dead already? And so he sends somebody out, and they come in, yeah, guess what? He's already dead. Okay. So uh, Joseph and Nicodemus, probably also a member of the Sanhedrin, but remember John chapter 3, you must be born again, that conversation, that Nicodemus. And Joseph, take the corpse of body of Jesus off of the cross. And, and that's not an easy thing. You've got to have some sort of a hammer to get those nails out. Or, you know, a, 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 like the claw on the back of a hammer, the leverage. And, and you've got to be you know, holding him up while you're doing all this. It was no easy task to do that. They got him off the cross and wrapped him in linen cloth and quick, because the sun's going down, put him in the, the nearest op, uh, place that was Joseph's own grave in a garden that was near at hand. So all of that happens on Friday. And 
the women were watching, not only at the cross, but they, they followed Joseph and Nicodemus and they saw the, the tomb and how there was a stone rolled in place. We, we know that there were men around the cross. We don't know if they followed to the tomb. We, we, maybe they did, we don't know. But then I would say began a dark night of the soul. Can we use that phrase for Jesus' followers? So all through Shabbat, Friday night through Saturday, they have nothing to do but think about what has just happened. And if we put ourselves in their shoes, they knew Jesus was legit. They knew it. We believe it. They knew it. They had seen him walk on the water. Anybody here seen anybody walk on water? No. They had seen him speak to the storm, and boom, it was immediately still. They had seen that. And in the Gospels where it talks about that, it says they had been afraid that they were going to die because of the storm and their boat going down. But as soon as Jesus spoke, they were, they were afraid for a different reason. Like, whoa, who does that? Who can speak to us from who does that? And they had seen that. They had seen Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead. They knew he was the Son of God. And they, they believed that he was the Son of God. And they had thought that he was the Messiah, or at least the Messiah they expected. But what do you do with a dead Messiah? And that raises a whole lot of issues. Because Jesus had predicted he would rise from the dead. Well, if he, if he didn't rise from the dead... Doesn't that make him either a liar or a deluge, delusional? Can you, can you say the name Chad Daybell? <laughs> well, they can be delusional or they can be liars and it's kind of hard to tell which. But Jesus had done all these things, and, but now he's dead. And what, what about the kingdom? I think there are three words that would describe the men and the women, followers of Jesus, from Friday about 3 o'clock until later on Sunday. Those words would be fear. Well, maybe the, maybe the disciples came and stole the body. No, they were, they were scared for their life. The Bible shows us that they were in a room with the doors closed and, and the implication is the doors were locked for fear that they might be next, for fear of the Jews. No, they, they were not some, hey, we're, we're going to go get them. Well, hey, you guys are going to take the Roman soldiers. You guys are going to move the stone. We are going to get that body out. No, they were, they were hunkered down for fear. I think another word that would describe them would be confusion. How, how in the world does this all fit together? I, I can't deny this, but I can't deny this either, and I don't, I'm confused. And then a third word would be doubts. Interestingly, in the passage we're about to read, as Jesus appears to them, he addresses their doubts. They are seeing him with their own eyes, and they're still struggling with doubts. And before we go on, just I want to ask this question. Have you ever gone through a time in your life where one or two or maybe all three of those things sort of described you. Fearful. What is going to happen? What's going to happen to me? Confused. Lord, I, I don't understand. I know you're a good God. I know you have good things in mind. Why is this happening to me? And doubts. Lord, I, 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 I believed you. I trust. I still do trust you. But I, I, I just have doubts as to whether or not it's really, truly all going to work out. That's sort of the human condition, isn't it, at different times in our lives? So that's where they were as Shabbat ended, Saturday night leads into Sunday morning. And interestingly, it's not the rough and tuddy, rough, rough and ready, tough and ready Marines who lead the way. It's not Peter, James, and John. It's the women who say, well, we've got to do what we've got to do. And we're not sure how we're going to do it, because we saw the stone. We know. 
In fact, as we were going to the tomb, they were asking the question, Who, who's going to roll that stone away from us? I don't know, let's just keep going. And they had brought spices and perfumes. Maybe they knew that Joseph had already done some of that when he wrapped the corpse. Maybe they didn't know. But they, they were going to add to it, bringing their perfumes and spices that early Sunday morning. And so then that begins what we call Resurrection Sunday. And a whole lot of things happen there. Uh, the women get to the tomb, it, see that it's empty, they see angels. And if, if I'm putting it together right, they go back and tell the men folk. <laughs> and here's, here's the men folk's reaction. They thought that these words were nonsense. Yeah, right. But Peter and John decide, well, we will check it out. So they run to the tomb. And the women go back to the tomb. Peter and John take a look. Well, you're right. Not here. They leave. Now the women are there. And they have an encounter again with an angel. But then as they are turning to leave, Mary Magdalene, we read, in another gospel, more than just her, actually had an encounter with the risen Savior. The first ones on Resurrection Sunday morning. The reaction was interesting. They grabbed a hold of his feet. We're not letting you go this time. Yes, they were worshiping, but they were, they were holding on too. Because Jesus had to say, let go of me. I have not yet ascended to, interesting what he says, my God and your God. Same God, but difference in who I am and who you are, but same God. My God and your God, and my Father and your Father. Now, go and tell my disciples, da, da, da. So, they go back and report this to the, the disciples. Somewhere along the, the day, that day, Jesus appears individually and apparently privately to Peter. And then there is this story in Matthew, Luke chapter 24, Two disciples taking a seven-mile journey. Where would that put us? Uh, uh, I grew up in Moscow, and Pullman was eight miles away. I always think of that. So it's about a Moscow to Pullman journey. But that, that's a bit of a journey. To a village, a town called Emmaus, and they're walking along. They're followers of Jesus, and they're talking about everything that's happened. And they had already, already heard of the reports of the women. So they, they had been probably with the group earlier that day. As they're walking along, Jesus joins them. Hey, what are you guys talking about? And so they have that conversation. They get to Emmaus, and it appears that Jesus is heading on. They say, look, it's, you know, the day's too, too late to go anywhere further down the road. Stay with us. Invite him to dinner. And Jesus has been explaining to them from the prophets and the writings of Moses all of the, the scriptures concerning his death and resurrection. So you know that at the breaking of the bread, they're at dinner. Their eyes, which had been closed spiritually, were opened, and they recognized, whoa, this is Jesus, and he vanished from their sight. So it was too late in the day, they had said, for Jesus to go on further, but it wasn't too late in the day for them to hot-foot it back to Jerusalem, the seven miles, and get back to the disciples and say, you won't believe what just happened. And as they got there, the disciples were kind of saying the same thing to them. Yeah, the women and Peter and da-da-da. And that leads us to our passage of Scripture. Turn to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. Verse 36, and John in uh, chapter 20 also tells us about this same incident, bringing out different aspects of it. But it's recorded in both John chapter 20 and here in Luke chapter 24. Verse 36, while they were, still, while they were telling these things, he himself, Jesus himself, stood in their midst and said to them, Shalom, peace be to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they were seeing a spirit. Had they ever thought that before about Jesus? 
Yes. When was it? When he was walking on the water. And they saw this form walking across. They thought that was a ghost too. Now they, they think the same thing here. They thought they were seeing a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And I told you we would get to this. And why do doubts arise in your heart? Really? They, I mean, they are looking eyeball to eyeball at the risen Jesus, and they're still struggling with doubts. I heard this once, and I think it bears repeating. It may not be right to doubt, but it is not sinful to doubt. It is human to doubt. What is wrong is to disbelieve. And there is a difference between doubts and unbelief. Unbelief is a choice I have made. I choose not to believe. Doubts are, phew, I'm, I'm wrestling with this one. Lord, help me. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And so here they were in, in this very scenario, and uh, doubts arising in some of, maybe all, some of their hearts. Then Jesus says, see my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While they still could not believe it because of their joy and amazement, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of, of a broiled fish, and he took it and ate it before them. And, and, it, and it goes on. Um, it's interesting here, they're struggling with doubt. And to paraphrase, Jesus says, examine the evidence. Now, he, he doesn't say that, but essentially, he says, are you struggling with doubt? Examine the evidence. Now, what do I mean by that? He actually, we just read it, gave them three different proofs, three different evidences that he had truly risen from the dead. He was not, a, not just a spirit. That's one thing. Well, you die and your spirit goes, oh, his spirit reappeared. Oh, it's like a vision. Oh, no, no, this is my body. There were three things he did. First of all, he said, look at my hands and my feet. Why would he say that? For the print, imprint of the nails. And then he said, now, now, go ahead, look. Ghosts don't have flesh and bone as you see that I have. There is a second proof. I, I, this is a material, corpor, corporeal body. And then thirdly, he says, by the way, it's not that he was hungry, but he says, do you have anything I can eat? And he ate in their presence. He was giving them three different physical proofs that it was really him in flesh and bone. Obviously, somehow different because he just appeared out of nowhere, but still flesh and bone. The title of the sermon, I guess it's about time to tell you the title, is The Resurrection of Jesus, colon. It's reality and it's relevance. But it is relevant because it was real, historically real. Well, examine the evidence. Easy enough for them. They're right there in the room with Jesus. Not so easy for us 2,000 years later. How do we examine the evidence? And let me just say this. We do not believe in the resurrection by blind faith. It's faith, but it's faith based on evidence. Well, what's the evidence? Okay, let's say this. Let's say that six months ago, there was a car accident at Eagle and Fairview. And as a result of that, somebody died. And there was some thought that perhaps it might have been criminal in, uh, intent, and so it goes to court, it goes to trial, okay? There is a pretty good chance that the judge presiding over that trial did not see the accident happen. 
there's a pretty good chance that the 12 jurors that have been picked did not witness the accident happen. And yet, they're the ones who have to decide did it or did it not happen and was there criminal intent involved? Well, how do we do that? Well, we do it, this is very, very elementary. But the first thing you do is, were there any eyewitnesses? And they come before the judge and the jury and they tell what they saw. They, they give their testimony. And you would also look for other things of evidence, like you would, you would send your CIS team out there and they would measure the tire skid marks and the, they would look at the vehicle and, and they, they'd probably do an autopsy on the deceased person and they would gather as much circumstantial evidence as they could as well. So that they could come to a decision what they believe happened based, they have to believe it because they don't know it. They didn't see it. That's how you know things. You actually see them or you, with your five senses you experience them. But no, they, they, the, the judge and the jury have to come to a decision what they believe happened based on the evidence. Are you willing to take the same intellectual integrity to the, the resurrection of Jesus as we would to the example I just gave you. Of course, that's how we, we do things. And so the evidence that we would examine today, just go through them quickly, well, we've got some eyewitness accounts there, don't we? Matthew, one of, who wrote the Gospel of Matthew, he was an eyewitness. Not, again, to Jesus rising from the dead. As I said, nobody saw that happen. But he was an eyewitness to Jesus after he rose from the dead. The resurrected Jesus. So was John. Two of the, the four gospel writers, eyewitnesses. What about Mark? He might have been. He wasn't one of the twelve. But he was a close companion of the apostle Peter. And scholars think that what Mark gives us, basically comes from everything he learned from Peter. And then you've got Luke himself, who probably wasn't an eyewitness. But at the beginning of his gospel, if you want to turn there, we won't do it now, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, he says, I have compiled the accounts of eyewitnesses. And he, is, is, and he says, and I've, I've done thorough research on this to put this account together as he wrote his gospel. So just like in a court of law, back to Fairview and Eagle, we have eyewitness accounts. What else? Well, now how many disciples did Jesus call? Well, there were 12. One of them was a defector, okay? So there goes Judas. So we've got 11 left. Not one of those 11 disciples ever recanted and said, oh, you know what? You know, it's just kind of a religious ruse we pulled off because we wanted to make money and build a church and be popular and all that kind of stuff, be important. Not one of them ever recanted. And seven of those 11 died as martyrs by being crucified, stoned, or thrown through with spears. They could have at any point said, you know what? It was a good run while it lasted, but it wasn't really true. I'm not going to die for a lie. No, I didn't really see the resurrected Jesus. Not one of them said that. So we've got some eyewitness accounts. We've got people who were, were eyewitnesses and, and went to their martyred death and never recanted. And there are other evidences that, that we can also marshal. Um, I'll give you one, okay? Boy, uh, in the culture we live in, my goodness. If this were an invented story, they would have done it differently. Who were the first witnesses to the resurrected Jesus? They were women. In this, in that day, women's testimony didn't even hold up in court. <laughs> I'm not agreeing with that, I'm just telling you the way it is. Women were not considered dependable witnesses. 
And yet who wrote, whoever wrote these stories said it was women who first saw Jesus, who first believed that he was risen from the dead, and who carried that message back to the disciples. So that, that's just another bit of evidence. Okay, here's the primary evidence right here. How do you account for the empty tomb? Within 50 days, Peter is preaching in the very city where Jesus was tried and sent to his death, in Jerusalem. So it wasn't like, you know, he's off somewhere else. In the very place it happened, Peter is preaching publicly in Acts chapter 2, and in Acts chapter 5, he's teaching and preaching in the temple, proclaiming that Jesus has risen from the dead. The easiest way to discredit Peter in that message is for the Jews to produce the body and say, no, 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 here's the corpse, he's lying. They didn't try to do that. You know what they did? They lashed and they, 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 they uh, uh, whipped Peter. Why? Because they knew they had no proof on their side. When the Roman soldiers came to them and said, whoa, the angel and the earthquake and the empty tomb, oh my goodness. They didn't say, you guys need some therapy because you're, you're delusional. Those things don't happen. And they didn't say, we think you're lying. We think you fell asleep at the job and the disciples came and stole the body. You get out there and you find that body. This blows my mind. It almost seems like the Jewish priests and, and elders actually believed him. Didn't change their mind about serving him or, or being converted, but they actually believed him. Why? Because they didn't go into search and rescue. They went into damage control. We will pay you a lot of money to lie. And if you get in trouble because, you know, you're Roman soldiers and you didn't really do your duty, we'll cover for you with Pilate. We'll take care of it. The empty tomb is the strongest, well, the eyewitness accounts, but is a very, very strong evidence, in fact, that Jesus rose from the dead. There are other proofs I could go into. Um, I won't. But I just want to conclude this, this part of my sermon by saying, when we believe that Jesus rose from the dead, our beliefs are lining up with the evidence, not going against the evidence. Okay, well, what does that mean to me? How is it relevant to me? Well, the first and main thing is that it proves everything Jesus claimed. He claimed he was the Son of God. He claimed he was the only way to get to God. And his resurrection validates his claims. But what does it mean to me personally? And I think here I would use one word. Hope. The resurrection of Jesus Christ means hope. Hope that death doesn't have the last word. If you've lost a loved one, maybe they were older in life. Maybe they were very, very young in life. There is hope because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ that death does not have the last word. You will see them again. Whoa, isn't that good news? Yes, as long as they trusted in Jesus, or I'll just say this, if they were not even old enough yet to have made a decision for or against Jesus, suffer the little children to come unto me, said the Lord. So there's hope. But there's also hope for me as I live this life. Hope because I know my sins are forgiven. Amen. Amen. Hope because I know no matter how rough my life gets, he's still in control. His word is still true that he, Romans 8, 28, he works all things together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Hope that he has a plan and a purpose for my life. And so far he's batting a hundred. <laughs> he never fails. And if I put my trust in him and follow him, he will lead me in the path that he has set for my life. Hallelujah. 
And then finally, we have hope that when we die, and I hate, hate to break it to you, but it's going to happen, unless the Lord comes back first. <laughs> when we die, we will go to heaven to be with him throughout eternity. Because Jesus said, he who believes in me shall live even if he dies. Speaking there of the eternal life we have with him. This is hope. Hope that the world, have you ever wondered why is the world so crazy? <laughs> what is going on in our world? The world doesn't have this hope. They don't have the hope of sins forgiven. They don't have the hope of heaven being their eternal home. They don't have the hope that even when my life is confused and out of order, God is still in control and he's working out his plan. They don't, they don't have that hope. Friends, we have that hope in Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 So I'm going to conclude with this. If you have never accepted Jesus as your Savior, I'm going to ask you to do that. Yeah, I'm going to give you an invitation to do that right now. And if you have asked Jesus to be your Savior, but have not been walking with him consistently, what better time to say today's the day. I'm going to begin to walk with him and live for him 100%. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you that you loved us so much you gave. You sent your only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. The call is to repent, believe in Jesus. Begin following him. If there's anyone here, Lord, who has never responded to that call, I pray that today they would think about the evidence, but more than that, recognize your knocking at the door of their heart, your call to them, and that they would say yes. Yes, Jesus. I trust you as my Savior, and I give my entire life without reservation to you. While we're praying, if there's anyone here who would say, today I want to make sure Jesus is my Lord, would you just slip your hand up? I'll see that. We will agree together in prayer that today is your day of salvation. If there's anyone here who would say, today I need to get right with the Lord and begin to live for him, I've believed in him, I still believe in him, but I want to start following him every day of my life, living for him. Would you raise your hand? And I will pray with you as well. There's one, there's two, there's three. Anyone else? Amen, amen. Let's stand together. Hallelujah. I'm going to ask you to repeat this prayer after me. Dear God in heaven, thank you for loving me. Thank you for giving your best, your very own son, to die in my place. On the third day you raised him from the dead. Today I acknowledge, Jesus, you're my Savior. And Jesus, you're my Lord. I'm asking you today, Lord Jesus, to help me live the rest of my life for you, to walk with you, to learn to know you better, to please you, and to have great fellowship with you. Thank you for the hope you've given me. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. Have a great rest of your Resurrection Sunday. And we will see you again in the Lord's house. Amen.